This is Gynecologic Surgeons Unscrubbed, a series-based podcast focusing on surgical and medical education and featuring expert interviews and practice-changing discussion. Our host is Dr. Kara King, a member of the Cleveland Clinic's section of minimally invasive gynecologic surgery. Dr. King is also the director of benign gynecologic surgery and associate program director of the Cleveland Clinic's MIGS Fellowship. This podcast is a collaboration between MD Edge and the Society of Gynecologic Surgeons. We'll be right back after this message. This podcast is made possible by Boston Scientific. To learn more about Boston Scientific, please visit bostonscientific.com. The opinions expressed in this podcast belong solely to the featured clinicians and do not necessarily reflect the views of Boston Scientific. And now, Dr. Kara King. So I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Ted Lee. He's coming from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He is the Director of Minimally Invasive Gynecologic Surgery at McGee Women's Hospital of UPMC, as well as a Program Director of their MIGS Fellowship. And personally, Dr. Lee has been extremely instrumental in my training as I trained with you during my fellowship at McGee. We've spent many hours in the operating room, and uh, I've learned a tremendous amount from you. So thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Carol, for such a nice introduction. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, whether formally or informally. So I think this is going to be somewhat informal, but we'll make it educational for the listeners. I love that. So let's just start out with your story. What was your experience moving to the States? Uh, I came to the States when I was 14. And my parents gave me the option of, you know, I can come to the States, they can support me, or I can stay back home and just go to the school I got accepted to through my national entrance exam. And me being, the, I think, somewhat of a risk taker, you know, I just feel like the system in Taiwan is somewhat uh, regimented and it's not very suitable for somebody who has a little bit more creative like myself to flourish. So I chose to come to the States. But initially, things were not what I expected because, you know, my language, you know, there's a language barrier. So I came to the States with barely any understanding of English. I went to a prep school in California. Within a week after I was there, uh, they realized my English was so bad that they kicked me out, basically. They refunded money to my parents. And you were 14 years old at this time? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So I had to find another school that would offer English as a second language. Um, and then uh, it was like an old military school that was converted to a high school. Uh, and then it was basically 30 people in one big room, all in, that's where our dorm is. And, you know, there's curfew and then, you know, at, at a certain time that the lights is out. And so you cannot study beyond that. So the only time you can study is, you know, the only place you have lights is in, in the bathroom. And there are times I would go to the bathroom and, and kind of, you know, study a little bit more. That was kind of my, my first year in the States. That is a tremendous story. I can't even imagine the culture shift. And you're all by yourself during that as well, right? I think things has kind of worked out for me pretty well. The summer following the first year, I went back to the school uh, and then tried out for the summer school. And they realized my English has improved a lot in that one year. They took me back. And then so I, I stayed there for the, uh, the next two years before I graduated from the high, the high school I went to initially. So the tenacity that you have now started back then. Well, I think the tenacity I have now is something that I feel over time, you know. But that was kind of the attitudes that nothing to lose kind of I, I i don't know if i just feel like i just feel like there's something that I, a path i need to take for me to get better you know, there was definitely some afterthoughts that i thought maybe i had made the wrong choice but fortunately everything turned out better than i expected fortunately i was able to get you know get into college into george i got into georgetown and that's why i spent you know the next four years in college at georgetown and did you know that you wanted to be a physician or a surgeon back when you were in California? I came from a medical family. My father is a general surgeon, uh, specialized in thyroid surgery. You know, so I, this is kind of things that I kind of experienced. And to be honest with you, I, I didn't really explore any other options. I mean, in, in college, I took a lot of different classes, but I just thought that becoming a doctor is what I wanted to do. So, yeah, that's what I did. I even took drama class, believe it or not. How to improvise. I thought that would, you know, improve my public speaking skills. Did it? How did, how did that go for you? I don't know. I, I, it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, I thought it was something that I can try something different. You know, Georgetown is like a liberal school, so you, you get to like take different classes. 
try different things out. So that was that. I love that story. It's an amazing story. So I want to bring this up early because I want to make sure we have enough time to touch upon it and not get too much into clinical things. But one thing that I love about you is your passion for fly fishing. And I know I've seen you so many times on YouTube looking at different videos on how to make different types of flies, right? All right. So I'm just curious, where, what initially attracted you to this sport? I actually had a hard time finding a job after residency. And then I took a position as a, um, at a small teaching hospital in Baltimore. And I was basically not busy at all. I would be seeing three, four patients at most in a half-day session. I had a huge office. I had a sofa bed in my room. I'd be taking a nap all the time. And, <laughs> you know, I, I had a lot of free time on my hand, basically, at that point. And, and you know, I mean, I would be, like, teaching the residents how the surgery is done, but yet I don't really have cases to teach them with. Yeah. And so that was the year. I, I just, I know, I want to learn how to fly fish. So I basically, back then, there was no internet. Uh, so I would go to the library, and I'll, borrow books and videos and, you know, kind of watch how it's done and, and went to a local fly shop and the guy said, well, we can just kind of teach you how to cast for free. And then the first time I caught a fish on a fly was uh, Halloween day, 1997. You remember the exact day? Well, because it's Halloween. But the year, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and so that was that. And then, you know, it's kind of like very creative, especially um, with fly tying. You know, that you be able to catch a fish or something that you make yourself, and that's very gratifying. And it's pretty much like cooking, but you can improvise a lot because you may not have all the materials that the, for the recipes for a certain fly you want to tie. You can just use whatever you have uh, so that you can just be very creative with it. Um, so I kind of enjoy that aspect of it. So, yeah, this is something I kind of enjoy, um, you know, to be out on the water on my own um, and just kind of listen to the, the rhythm of the stream. I think it's very soothing and just calm your mind. And that's what I do um, when I have time uh, to, to do that. And I took your husband out when you were in Wisconsin. You did. And I, that was a great experience there. You went into the cow pastures Yeah, like that southern was, Wisconsin. Yeah, I was telling people that it's like a fly fishing uh, in like a golf course, basically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like flat Perfect green yeah, lawn everything because is of the cows. Kind of manicure, you know, and then you, you there's no obstructions, no trees to deal with. Uh, you can cast pretty easily without snagging anything. It's a perfect environment for a beginner fly fisherman. Right, perfect for Drew. It's like our like nice little six to eight week hist. Yeah, exactly. It's funny because you talk about watching videos and how to make flies, and that was such that's such a huge part of your education. Like teaching us when I was your fellow, it was always, you know, record yourself, watch yourself, watch what your hands are doing, watch what your assistant's hands are doing. You know, you, you, you um, have that critical eye with video. So it's, it's interesting that you started there, you know, fly fishing and watching videos. There well, I mean, it's, it's very similar. It's, it's, it's a form of instruction, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, I never thought of it, but I think that probably got me started about how to kind of instruct, how to, how to teach through videos how to kind of present important points and obviously show through the surgical sequence uh, how things are done. And that's very, very similar to when people make videos about fly fishing. You need to have a, like an objective when you watch those videos, right? Because that is how you do this. And pretty much in surgery, you, know, you want to show people how this is done and tips and tricks about how things get done and the potential obstacles that you may encounter. And, you know, it's kind of the things that you you learn as an educator. That's what you need to do. Yeah, and also how to break up complex tasks, right? People uh, can only take so much information at a time. So if you don't break it up into small components, it's information overload and they don't learn anything. So it's important to kind of break it up into little pieces so that's something that's digestible they can use. Otherwise, people kind of, is too much for them, and then they cannot learn as much. Right, their bandwidth is maxed out. I remember when I was a first-year fellow, you, <laughs> you used to say to me, you know, King, you're working on like a 1985 PC. Like my brain was working a little bit slower, and you were on like a, 
<laughs> you're on like a 2020 iPhone. So yeah, I, I, I think about that with my learners sometimes and that things that are come very, very easy to us, right? Like their, their bandwidth is maxed out and they've shut down and you have to be able to catch that. So right, exactly. You yeah. definitely taught me yeah, that. There's only so much you can learn. And, and, and then also too is, is as you get better, you begin to know what's relevant and what's not relevant, okay? And then you don't spend your brain power on something that's irrelevant to the task. And that's frequently a lot of learners kind of get bogged down on little things that's irrelevant to their learning. Uh, and then they don't have enough bandwidth to learn what's important. They don't know how to prioritize it yet. So you mentioned your first practice having like four patients in a half day and taking naps a lot. And now you're one of the busiest MIG surgeons out there, right? You started your fellowship in 2001. Right. You've put out so many fellows and have built a really phenomenal practice. What was the biggest surprise when you started your practice? Let's start when you moved to Pittsburgh and started your practice at McGee, because you were obviously the first MIG doc there. What was the biggest surprise when you started that practice? I think we have to go back a little bit, because by the time that I came to McGee, I have already gone through my learning curve already. Go, yeah, go farther back then, yeah. Yeah, because so <laughs> that year when I was fly, learning how to fly fish, I just feel like, well, you know, I want to be a gynecologic surgeon and this is going nowhere basically, right? And so I want to be a surgeon, but I'm not in the environment where I can learn surgery. And so I feel like my, I'm kind of wasting my professional life away. Uh, and then there's a publication called OBGYN News. It was very, very popular back when I was a resident, basically is something everybody reads to get an update as to what's going on um, in our field. And there are like a lot of advertisement in the back of the OBGYN news for jobs and for courses and so on. And so I saw an advertisement from Dr. Tom Lyons and Dr. C.Y. Liu. Uh, they were back then, you know, the, the sort of the big names in minimally invasive surgery uh, circle in gynecology. I didn't know exactly what I do. I just recall one of my residents a year ahead of me, who was also one of your mentor, Oscar Amongli. Oh, Oz, I love him. Yeah, and uh, he mentioned, you know, back, I just remember when he was a resident, he, said, he told me he went to AEGL and he saw CY Lu did live surgery and it was amazing. And so that's, that's the only thing I remember about that name. And so when I saw that name is, you know, and then Dr. Tom Lyons, they were supposed to do a combined fellowship together. But in the end, they each have their own fellowship. So the timeline for the fellowship was a little bit different. With, with CY, his fellowship starts in January, and with Tom, his fellowship starts in July. And so some of the timelines would fit better for uh, Tom, Tom's uh, fellowship. That's why I spent one year in Atlanta in between 1997 and 98. And you found him in the back of ob News? I did not know that. Yeah. And then he told me that I was among over 100 applicants for the position. Wow. I don't even know how I got a, mm-hmm. got a spot, you know, but and so I was a little lucky. So that was kind of my break. So, yeah, that's how I got into the minimum invasive surgery. And then I, after that, I was a faculty at, at GW after fellowship. So I kind of like did my learning curve there. So back when I was a fellow, we were using NDG laser. A small, as kind of our pre cutting tool, but it was not available in most hospitals. So I switched to Hamala Scalpel Polar. That was kind of my tool. And then towards the end, while I was in DC, I switched to monopolar scissors, like endo shears, because I saw when Dr. C.Y. Lu does a lot of his cutting with, like, basically, uh, you know, like a bovie, basically, with his, his scissors. And I thought it was very, very efficient very very clean uh, and then so that's how kind of I, I switch so by the time when I came to McGee that was my primary kind of uh, weapons uh, <laughs> of, of, of weapons. weapons of choice was basically uh, a bipolar dissector Maryland dissector and and endo shears it's beautiful when you do it elegantly it's, it's a really nice way to do surgery you break up a good point that you wanted to be a surgeon but without the volume you couldn't ever get there, right? Like you have to, you have to have the volume in order to push the envelope and improve your skill, which I think is a really, it's a prominent point in today's day with training. A lot of people really want to be able to operate, but if you don't have the volume and don't have that niche, then it's hard to get better. Well, it was, you know, initially when I started GW, 
nobody knows what a minimally invasive surgeon is. And most general BGYN feel that they can do the same surgeries that I do. And so, yeah, so it was, referral wasn't automatic. It really takes time and it really, you know, you really need to really focus on convincing people you can do things well. And then it takes a while for you to build that practice. I was doing something totally new and different from other people. So there's definitely some adversarial uh, relationship between myself and the general BGYNs. I think that's still true for a lot of fellows that graduate who go to a new place. They experience very, very similar mm -hmm. kind of challenges. I'm sure that it's basically something that I'm still today is still happening as well. And so I face the same kind of um, you know challenges uh, sort of with the general BGYNs. So it wasn't easy. Uh, but over time, I think the support of the department and the chair that they really want to make sure that the minimally invasive surgery uh, has, has a strong presence in, in the, the hospital, in the department, and, uh, and then begin to kind of create like a referral uh, type of pattern that allow us to flourish. Um, that sort of make my job a lot easier. So it definitely require a, a, a chair or a system that support this type of surgery. So in addition to the chair support, which is crucial to starting a practice, what other tips can you offer new graduates, whether they're starting their own practice or joining a practice that's already there, but you're new to the area? What kind of tips can you offer to, to, to build that practice? I'm sure it's better now compared to when I started because you kind of walk into the lion's den. Basically, people are kind of looking for you to fail because you are such a threat to the existing structure. And so that you really have to kind of make sure that you have like as little complication as possible. And so it's a very fine balance of like having like be able to do very, very difficult cases uh, and have very little complications. And so because the people are going to be extremely critical when you get to a new place, you have to prove yourself. Uh, and when, when if you start out with lots and lots of complications and lots of long cases, which has happened to me, obviously, because when I started out, I, you know, everything took a little longer and so on. Uh, but, you know, but over time, uh, if you persist, uh, then, you know, you get better and you, you, you know, people realize that you're doing things faster and better uh, and safer. You know, I always tell the fellows when they get to a new place, don't take unnecessary risk, be humble, uh, and then, uh, you know, just do the things you feel confident with. Uh, and then just push your envelope very, very slowly initially the first few years because the first two or three years is crucial. It sort of make and break your career at that location. If you have lots of complications the first few years, chances are you won't do well. You lose the trust of your colleagues. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, you, you ingrained that so early in me and it's made such a big difference in my practice where I first started and my move now in that proper case selection and just just like you said people are going to send you crazy stuff because they're they're challenging you and they're pushing you so being smart about what cases you bring back and then loading the boat when appropriate so having the appropriate backup for cases that that will allow you to push the envelope a little bit versus surprising people with issues that come up in the OR I think you've taught me that as well yeah I think too is is just uh, you know uh, don't be afraid to ask for help but ask for help early you know ask for help like before the case even start, right? Exactly. It's part of your pre-op planning is that if you think this patient may need some general surgery work, bowel work, or somebody, you know, if you have a good MIS urology team in your hospital, which may or may not always exist, you want to the patient, you want to introduce the patient to those physicians and not to do that when the patient's already asleep and you're having some, you know, then those doctors don't like it because they haven't met the patients and they don't feel comfortable doing things uh, for the patients because of the medical legal risk. But once you have involved them early and then the things does, okay, well, this patient needs to have bowel surgery, this patient needs to have bladder uterine surgery, some of which you may or may not be to do on your own, depends on how you feel. I mean, obviously I do quite a bit of my own bowel work and quite a bit of my urological work, but that's not true for everybody. But regardless, is that get those people involved early on in the process will make you feel a lot better and also allow you to push yourself a little bit more.
because you'll be less timid. Uh, because it, well, if I cut a bow, you know, they're gonna fix it anyway. They're so already you, on backup. Yeah, exactly. Right, and then so you can you can dissect a little bit more aggressively if you need to be, uh, and you learn from that process, and so you sort of create a safety net for you to push a little bit further. And so that that has been always you know something I tell the, the fellows when they finish is that find your own safety net within your system. And that's very, very important. And once you have that, you can push yourself surgically so much faster and become a much better surgeon that way. Because ultimately, you have to take some risk. If you don't want to take any risk, then there's no way for you to get any better. And so, yeah, so it's really up to the learners that if they want to, to, to take that risk or not. You know, and I tell the fellows, it's, like, it's perfectly fine if you don't feel you want to push yourself that much. It's okay. Because you still serve the patients well, right? You don't have to be the super surgeons, you know. Uh, you don't have to be. You can just be a safe, reliable surgeon and be able to do things efficiently. And you don't have to take too much risk. And that's perfectly fine. Not everybody needs to take risk. But knowing your limits is what you, is what you train us, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and then I'm just telling you the, sort of the tricks that you need to have to allow you to go a little bit further, a little bit further, okay? I mean, a lot of this is, you know, like a, it's an evolution, right? It's not like all of a sudden I decided that I'm going to do something that nobody else have done before or something I had never done before. Yeah, that's going to happen, but it happened mostly because you have done something similar to it, and now you are doing a procedure that's similar, and so that is more of an evolution. So you have that as a backup, right? You have that foundation you don't just go out of blue and do something totally crazy exactly and then once you build your tribe like you mentioned you know you have your your colorectal doc that you work with and your urology doc that you work with then a lot of times when you call them in they don't even scrub right they let you do it and they can just be there in case something happens that also helps push you a bit i have found too exactly exactly yeah that's part one of this interview be sure to check out the next episode for part two we'll be right back after this message In this portion of our podcast, we turn to advocacy and continue our conversation with Dr. Megan Evans, women's health advocate and assistant professor of OBGYN at Tufts University School of Medicine. In this episode, we'll be discussing how a bill becomes a law, as well as ACOG's advocacy efforts and lessons learned. So with all this talk about um, these different bills that are being presented, I'm just curious, how exactly does a bill become a law? Only members of Congress can introduce legislation. And as soon as they introduce legislation, they become a sponsor of that bill. And that's important because when you go to the Hill and you are advocating for a certain piece of legislation, you want to see who's sponsoring the bill, so who introduced it, whether on the House or the Senate side, and who has signed on to support that bill or co-sponsored it. So if you were to go and advocate for a certain bill on contraception access. If your member already co-sponsored it, then you thank them for co-sponsoring. They don't need to hear about it. They've already signed on to it. But if they hadn't co-sponsored, then that's a great opportunity to tell your representative why they should co-sponsor it. So as soon as a bill is introduced, it's referred to a committee. And for health care, there are two committees in the House side and two committees on the Senate side that are health care bills are often referred to. So on the House side, it's energy and commerce. They deal with health care in general, as well as Medicaid. The Ways and Means Committee on the House side primarily deals with Medicare. On the Senate side, the health care committees are the HELP Committee, which is, stands for Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. So again, they deal with public health in general. And then the Finance Committee works with or focuses on Medicare and Medicaid. So that is the first step of getting a bill passed. If the committee does not act on a bill, it's essentially dead and it will not go anywhere. So it sounds like you have to do a little bit of homework before you go to the Hill or wherever you're going because you don't want to waste somebody's time if they're already co-sponsoring a bill, right? You don't want to waste their time and tell them about it when they're already on board. So a little bit of homework is necessary. And you mentioned having a sponsor of that committee and then co-sponsors. How many co-sponsors can there be? Is there a cap or is it just whoever agrees with that bill or how does that work? Yeah, there's no cap, but certainly 
the more co-sponsors just is representative of how people feel about this bill and how much support it has. How much momentum it has, yeah. Right. Got it. Okay, so a bill is born. Mm-hmm. And then we have committee action, right? And this will all be in the podcast notes, guys. So if you go to the GY Insurgents Unscrubbed podcast page, you will see all of these notes. And then we get to subcommittee review. Right. Is that right? Yeah. So bills can be referred to a subcommittee for either a study, which is just basically gathering more information. Some people feel like if a bill goes to study, it's not a favorable outcome. Or hearings. So hearings can provide the opportunity to put things on the record through experts, public officials, supporters, and of course, opponents. So we have had ACOG members go to the Hill and testify in front of these hearings in support and in some cases in opposition of legislation. And that's really important because we certainly want our voice at the table. We're experts in this field and we should be part of these conversations when it comes to bills that affect our field and our patients. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm excited to hear how we can actually become some of these experts. So when the hearings are completed and the subcommittee, then they may what's called mark up the bill. So people might hear that, that the bill's in markup. And that basically means they're making changes to the bill, they're adding amendments to it, and then they're bringing it back to the full committee. So if the subcommittee votes not to move forward, then the bill dies. If they do, then it goes back to the full committee, and then the full committee can vote on its recommendations to whether the House or the Senate, depending on which chamber they're in. So if a bill dies, can it ever come back, or is it dead forever? It can. So it can come back. People can try to reintroduce a different bill, a different version of it. It's important to know that a congressional year is a two-year cycle. If nothing happens to your bill and the congressional year ends and a new congressional year starts, so for example, that would just happen at the beginning of 2019 was a new congressional year, your bill automatically dies and you may have to reintroduce it in the next congressional cycle. Got it. Could that also work to your benefit with a new set of people that may get more momentum? Definitely. Yeah? I mean, so you can use that to your to your advantage exactly. as well. Exactly. So you think about the makeup of the house changed quite a bit from 2018 to 2019. And so that could definitely work to your advantage in the house, for example, or the Senate, depending on what the goal is. Okay. Then what? So if um, the committee then votes on it. The goal is to then get it to the House floor or the Senate floor for a vote on the floor and then to potentially move forward. Now, in the House, it's up to the Speaker of the House, which is currently Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi, what comes to the floor. In the Senate, it's the same thing. So Majority Leader Senator Mitch McConnell can decide if he wants to bring it to the floor for a Senate vote or not. Now, what's interesting about the Senate is that individual senators can place a hold on legislation, which means it can't come to the floor until the senator's concerns are satisfied. So the Senate, it, there's a few more steps that that bill could potentially take before it gets to the floor for a vote. The House, it's really up to the Speaker of the House. So if it makes it to the floor, there's debate and there could be approval of any amendments, and then the bill is either passed or defeated by the members. If it's passed, then it's sent over to the other chamber. Now, the other chamber could have a similar bill. So let's say both chambers pass similar bills, but they're not identical. Then you would have to have a committee that's put together to reconcile any differences between the House and the Senate. And then if those agreements are reached, then they present their findings and both the House and the Senate must approve this committee's report. After that, then the House and the Senate can both vote on identical versions of the bill, so there can't be any differences in it. And then if both chambers vote in favor of it, then it goes to the president's desk for signing into law. Got it. That's a really long process. It is a really long process, yeah. And I think you know what's important is that when we go to the Hill for an afternoon to advocate for a, a bill, 
your advocacy really doesn't stop after the day is over. It's following up. It's making sure that, you know, what's happening in, at the committee level? What information do you need from us? How can we help get this bill across the finish line? And, you know, especially I think social media can really help in that aspect by putting pressure on um, different legislators to continue to act on, especially legislation that we think is really important for our patients. Um, but, you know, we always learn. So if the bill dies, we learn from it and we can start again with new legislation. And that's all for this episode of Gynecologic Surgeons Unscrubbed. Join us next episode for more expert insights and perspectives. From all of us at MD Edge and the Society of Gynecologic Surgeons, thanks for listening.